Welcome to EDGE. I'm Robert Krulwich. In this month's program, a look at the violent world of the photographer they called Ouija. America has thousands of photographers and a growing number of video enthusiasts who, if they come upon a crime, can whip out their cameras and shoot. Well, the godfather of all crime photographers was a man they called Ouija who during the 1930s and 40s took the most extraordinary photographs on the streets of New York. And we decided to have another look at his work. I took a leaf out of the Racketeers book and took over New York City for myself. No other freelance photographer was allowed to work out of Manhattan Police Headquarters. This was my exclusive territory. I would start my tour at midnight. First, I checked the police teletype for background on what had been happening. Then, into my car. I would turn on the police radio, then the car radio, which I tuned to the egghead stations for classical music. Life was like a timetable, tragic, but on schedule. Arthur Fellig, but everyone calls me Ouija. He was creative. He was before his time, he knew what he was doing. The other guys were lazy. They, some of them might have thought about it, but they, uh, it was good enough, you know. But Ouija had to be one step better in order to sell the picture, you see. And he was actually two steps better, you know. What made Ouija unique were several factors. First off, he was the first news photographer to regularly photograph the response to an event, not just the event itself, and that came from freelancing. He had to do something different from staff photographers at the scene. Second thing is he had a wonderful sense of humor. He knew how to create a photograph. He also knew how to take advantage of what was there. What he is probably most famous for was recognizing signs. He would, was able to spot the signs, spot the situation, juxtapose them, and those three things almost immediately, if you're looking at a photograph from, say, 1940 to 1955, you know it's Ouija. Uh, these aren't just relics that you look at fondly. They stand up. That means that uh, he did it right, and he was among the first to do it. Uh, he made a great impression on me, an awful lot of other photographers. Um, his pictures also he had a way of bouncing from uh, from stark drama to uh, to comedy, very very funny situations, and yet I had um, I had some misgivings about uh, the way he operated. But then again, you have to think back to uh, to that era. By the time Ouija was photographed in the late 1930s, prohibition was over but the gangsters were fighting for power and so it was possible to go out and photograph regular killings literally nightly. Ouija loved to do this. Uh, he used to tell the, th the story of the first murder shot he ever took. Uh, the man apparently was kind of down in a ditch by the walk and uh, 
he had come up against it and saw it and stopped and was beginning to be sick. And then he wondered what, how the family were feeling. So he turned his camera and um, got the picture of the older relatives and the small children. And that started him. I was taking some of the best killing pictures of my career. Sometimes I even used Rembrandt side lighting, not letting too much blood show. And I made the stiff look real cozy, as if he were taking a short nap. I don't mind photographing gangsters littering up the gutters. To me, it's in the nature of a slum clearance project, and I say good riddance. Our 401, our 401, Pearson Clothing Store, 212. Ouija had a, uh, a police radio in his car that he'd gotten from the, uh, either deputy police commissioner or commissioner himself. When he would get calls, and he always went to the best ones. He always, and if he didn't find the best one, he created a good picture on the bum job, you know. He was very creative. Somehow the word spread that I was psychic because I always managed to have my pictures in the hands of the paper before any news of the event was generally known. The girls around Acme gave me my name after the current rage, the Ouija board. Ouija. I liked it. Ouija's name was actually given to him by a uh, man at Acme News Pictures where he was working in the dark room. He was an ugly man, uh, Ouija was. and. There was a joke by this one man that he looked like the, one of the pictures on a Ouija board. Ouija, as he became known, then had to embellish on this and said it's because he had this tremendous instinct. He always knew where to be at the right place at the right time. And so they thought he was clairvoyant and psychic and got this from the spirit world. His standards, his ethical standards, uh, would leave a lot to be desired today. Ouija seemed to, uh, always seemed to think, he always maintained that it was the, uh, the final picture that counted more than, uh, than anything else, including, uh, in some ways, uh, the story itself. He, he played by hard rules, hard, fast rules. And uh, his feelings were that uh, you do it, it doesn't really bother them that much because they're so tied up in their grief that they don't realize you know, they may get angry, but, you know, it's, it's nothing compared to what has just happened in their lives. That's the way he was. Ouija was so close to the police by essentially bribing them with free photographs that he could do pretty much anything he wanted. He also could get away with having the police manipulate the scene. Uh, most of the pictures people think are manipulated were not. But, say, if a gun was out of the picture, he would ask one of the police officers to move it if the officer wouldn't or didn't know him that well. He'd sort of walk over and kick it a little bit and then walk around and kick it a little bit when no one was watching. But usually he'd get the police to move a corpse or do whatever he needed for a better photograph. Ouija had, uh, had a, a great picture of uh, a body. It was a, a rub out and uh, there was a sign. Ouija swears straight up and down that uh, in that case uh, he had the body moved, that it was brought, brought closer to where the sign was. I find that hard to believe that even in that era, you know, that, uh, that he'd get that kind of cooperation. I think that uh, any police officer that would have anything to do with that would, would hear about it. So um, I have some doubts. If uh, you needed to move something a little bit, to make it more effective. He did, I'm sure. He was the individual that kept to himself. 
And I think most people knew that. They didn't quite know what to make of him. He was um, um, big and baggy and didn't care how he looked. And um, that sometimes attracted more attention to him than the fact that he was taking good pictures. The, the Ouija image is one of an absolute slob of a man, totally illiterate, who went around smelling bad, looking bad, and being a womanizer. The reality was Ouija was a brilliant intellectual, a man who was extremely well read. In the early days of his freelancing, he would write as well as photograph, which a lot of people don't realize. They assumed that later when he became famous, any writing that was done was, was ghosted by someone else. Uh, he created the image of Ouija. Part of the trouble with my freelance photography, I decided, was overproduction. There were so many dead gangsters stretched out in various localities every night that the editors were getting real choosy. After all, they said, this is a family newspaper. I had so many unsold murder pictures lying around my room that I felt as if I were renting out a wing of the city morgue. He found that his pay varied with the number of bullets it showed. He would get a fee, it was like $5 per bullet hole that was visible in the victims. The problem he ran into was he became so good at this and made so much money that when World War II came and the draft came, most of the men called soldiers in the mafia were drafted. So suddenly the killers were going overseas being paid less to do the same work they had done in New York, and Ouija was without his favorite subjects and had to find a broader range of interests until the war was over and the killers came back. Ouija would go out night after night and take a single image that would be representational of people. Uh, he went everywhere, from the very poorest to the very wealthiest. So they become timeless photographs that gave people a sense of humanity. too much about social problems. Uh, he didn't um, make a point of, uh, of taking social problem um, pictures, but at the same time they popped up every once in a while. He wasn't the harsh person that his baggy clothes sometimes suggested, you know. All of his pictures had impact, all of them. Whether you liked them or didn't like them, they hit you. They hit you right in the eyes. And that's what, uh, what a good news picture should do. He was a, a slob. What a great photographer. <laughs> I have no inhibitions, and neither has my camera. I have lived a full life and have tried everything. What may be abnormal to you is normal to me. If I had to live my life over again, I would do it all the same way, only more so.